Hello. This talk is about how I've used a 45-year-old tool to make Python development a lot easier. Hi, I'm Colin Dean, and I'm a lead AI engineer at Target AI. I wear many hats. I'm a software engineer and community builder since 2002. I've been a developer for these 20 years or so. I started out in PHP before moving to Ruby, Java, and then a proprietary language for work. Then spent many years working in Scala before picking up some Rust and Groovy. I came back to Scala for a while and now I find myself working in Python for about the last 18 months. I focus a lot on developer experience. I believe that good tools and good practices enable building good software. I'm a huge fan of addressing problems through problem diagnosis remedy approach consistent with medical and other scientific approaches to problem solving. If you search for Colin Dean problem diagnosis remedy on the web, you can find my writings on it. At a high level, I'll be talking about the pains I experienced and have observed in the last approximately 18 months as an experienced developer working in Python for the first time since 2005. I'll talk about barriers to productivity in a Python code base and how I've overcome them using a venerable tool, Make. This solution is in active development, so some things might have changed since I last recorded this. I'd love feedback and suggested improvements. First, some problems. Working with my team of engineers and data scientists, we encountered these problems. What Python version should I use for development or production? How do I install Python at a specific version? How do I ensure my project works on a diverse development and production installation base? And how do I install dependencies? If you're getting a tingling feeling that all of this could be written down somewhere, you're getting the same feeling I felt within the first week of working in Python for the first time in more than 15 years. My diagnosis. My team uses Mac OS for development. Apple tends to keep its Python 3x installation within Python EOL dates, but it's always a little out of date. Apple says not to rely on this, and it's for internal use only, a policy similar to Homebrew's, but at least Homebrew's Python won't just disappear someday. This one is a bit of a given. Nearly all Python developers with a project in production learn quickly not to use a Mac OS provided Python. There are a ton of ways to install and use Python. My team was consistently bringing their own Python, installing it however they felt was most appropriate. Using system provided Python is wrong. It'll change and go away. Using homebrew Python is hitting a moving target and is inadvisable. Using PyEnv is probably as correct as choosing Anaconda, which Python speed reports as the most performant, but both require knowledge of the tool and some setup. I'm sure there are still Mac ports holdouts somewhere in the audience, and the rumblings of the next horn can be heard in the distance. It's okay if you don't know what any of these are, because this is developer experience, and in the end, it should abstract them away and do so on a per-repository basis with conventions established across teams. Another problem is that we don't have a clear single source installation of our Pythons, and we don't use versions consistently. While many of our projects are tied to a particular version because of a hard requirement from our cluster, we still had unexercised freedom to choose updated versions in other contexts, including containerized services and pipelines. PIP is a venerable tool and under the hood, even poetry uses PIP, but PIP was built in a time outside of configuration file conventions. The new PEP standard pyproject.toml really helps a lot, but takes some steps to get to development cycle usability. All of these steps are automatable. If a repo is not using poetry or needs to use pip in an intermediary step, then it's best to script these actions instead of executing them manually, having listed them in a readme. Pythonistas seem pretty accustomed to having packages just work when installed. Unfortunately, Apple's transition from Intel processors to its own processors, switching from x86-64 architecture to ARM64 in the process, is complicating installing Python dependencies. Nearly two years in, many projects still have not released macOS ARM64 binary packages. There are many variables and barriers to this, notably the slim availability of macOS ARM64 continuous integration system runners capable of building the binaries. Nevertheless, it necessitates building some packages from the source distribution that requires passing arguments or environment variables to Python packaging tools. This is scriptable, but we can write a bunch of scripts for this automation, but eventually any sufficiently advanced system of one-off scripts eventually re-implements a proper DAG, directed exit graph. So let's just use one from the start. Thus the remedy. 
We need a task runner for onboarding and resync instead of just better documentation. So let's install it from somewhere else. We're not bound to Apple's whim and we're all using the same versions, the same tooling with the possibility for the same experience to build a common vocabulary and common procedures for developing and debugging a code. There are a ton of ways to install and use Python. Use the system provided Python, install a minor version package from Homebrew directly with caveats about rolling updates. And don't forget that a version switch is system wide. Install a Homebrew version manager such as uh, PyN or ASDF that can install specific minor or patch versions and easily switch per directory, or install from Homebrew another specialized package manager such as Anaconda that can install optimized Python builds in an environment activated per project or per directory. For our team, Homebrew or Conda were the go-tos for the most part. I chose PyEnv because it seemed to be the lowest barrier to entry to get the exact version of Python we needed and avoid changing it from underneath the developer when they're running updates. I allowed the user to have Conda or Homebrew managed Pythons active because I didn't want to break existing setups without a clear need to do so. Homebrew as a base requirement is safe for us as we're all on Macs or Linux. I quickly settled on Poetry as most Python projects seem to be gravitating towards it or pipbenv. Nearly all Python tooling has committed to supporting in the now standardized pyproject.toml format. Poetry's own installer smartly manages a separate virtual end, avoiding a pesky problem where evicting dependencies not in an app's dependency tree can break Poetry or other similar tools. And, of course, Poetry combines dependency management and packaging into one smart tool. It's nearly a no-brainer. There are a ton of ways to install Poetry. The Poetry maintainers strongly encourage using their installer, PipX. While it can be installed via Homebrew or via Pip, Upstream doesn't support a brewed Poetry and warns that Pip installed Poetry may create version conflicts. We have encountered this problem and hobbled Poetry in the process. The reason Poetry maintainers want users to install with the official installer or PipX is automatic and reliable virtual environment isolation. Poetry doesn't need to be installed inside of a code base's active virtual environment. Rather, it manages it externally. So when we install Poetry, it uses whatever Python 3 is available because it's probably safe to do so. When running Poetry, it creates its own virtual env and creates a virtual env for the code base. The user can instruct Poetry which Python executable to use whenever creating the virtual env. I rejected a few commonly suggested solutions out of productivity concerns. The ideal solution would keep development iterations as quick as possible and encourage test-driven development to produce high-quality software. But I needed some kind of glue to make all of this automated from some common tooling. I needed the greatest common denominator. I've long used a minimal make setup in every ecosystem to provide a common onboarding experience, be it a Java project using Maven and Gradle, an SBT project for Scala, or projects in Ruby, Rust, and Groovy, and a variety of other ecosystems I've worked in, all with varying maturity of their build system and dependency retrieval tooling. Make is widely available and built into macOS, or at least enough of a standard make installation to be useful. We can build a make file, the configuration for the program, that we can pretty easily share across most Python projects. Lastly, invoking particular tools, specifically in CI, we can execute execute make tasks and allow that repo to have its own configuration for running. That way we can strike the right balance of convention and configuration. This is the most basic usage of make. With this, you can run make task and the command will run. It'll run every time you invoke it. You may see dot phony near this. This simply declares that the task will never produce a file and should be executed every time as it encountered in the task DAG. The other basic use case for Make is to produce files. Originally, Make was intended to compile source files and is still widely used in C and C++ projects for that purpose. I've even used Make to compile Java projects very long ago. In this example, you can see that the output file has a task that depends on an input file. That input file could have a task of its own, but Make can figure that out as well. In this invocation, I've used some Make variables dereferencing the in output and input respectively. A full Make tutorial is out of scope for this presentation. If you're interested in such, I encourage you to check out some other documentation on the web. Make is about 45 years old, so you'll probably find some useful content. One such work is the automation chapter of a self-guided workshop I built in 2020 about plain text accounting. That chapter goes into Make in nearly the exact same style that I use in many of my Python projects. But you may be asking, why not use something else? I've used probably two-thirds of these suggestions, and they're great for a particular ecosystem, but literally none beat the ubiquity of Make. When the developer experience is the primary focus, using what the developer already has available to bootstrap the rest is very important. It's very easy to install one of the above tools should a code base necessitate it, but having a Make file that bootstraps that installation is nigh unavoidable. A principal engineer at Heroku 
many years ago, instituted a policy of having a make file with these four steps in every code base, even if all depths do was to install another build tool and all the other tasks which simply ran that build tools, similarly named tasks. Some others surfaced over that time that made sense too. This had the effect of ensuring a clean onboarding process for anyone who may come along working on a particular project. That was a great success for developers unfamiliar with a particular ecosystem's tools and got them productive nearly immediately. Clone the repo and then run make. Wait a few minutes and then you're in a red-green refactor test-driven development cycle with tooling virtually guaranteed to work. This inclusivity is a key part of healthy engineering culture. Okay, that got a little ranty, but I wanted to clarify the reasons I'm so adamant about developer experience and this particular way of realizing it. Please talk to me if you think there's a better way. I've got strong opinions weekly held. So a brief overview of our particular setup. A while ago, I came upon an excellent help generator task that I now use just about everywhere. This enables a self-documenting make file with helpful output. No reading of a make file is required to understand that what the tasks do while keeping the task names typable. With one command, make depths, a whole cornucopia of software necessary to work on the code base gets installed. Libraries from Homebrew, PyEnv, Poetry, Python, and all Python dependencies everything. If we need to rerun one of the steps, we can rerun it without running other things. We use Peru to retrieve some large files used in texting. It's a great ecosystem agnostic dependency retriever as an alternative to Git submodules or a script that dumbly copies data. We can run tests with a simple make test. We can also tell Poetry to build a wheel, an Estes, and to publish them on our internal PyPI repository. And of course, we have plenty of code quality checks. We love Flakate, Black, MyPy, and more that enabled us to write maintainable code that captures our intent. This is not without some challenges. As M1 Macs roll out to our developers, there's a small but necessary challenge to supporting both Intel and ARM architectures. I'd hoped that enough time it had passed for the Python ecosystem to have fully shipped binaries for ARM Macs, but that's simply not yet come to pass. I found that as of Python 3.10 in mid-2022, I have to compile some dependencies from source because in a lot of cases, Python is merely a nice wrapper around a library written in a compiled language like C, C++, or Rust. This is an example of what's necessary to do that. You'll probably see this in just about every make file that necessitates setting compilation flags for poetry to use. Here, I'm referencing dependencies needed by PyODBC and H5Py, which for the foreseeable future necessitate compilation from source in order to install on an ARM64 Mac. Note that uname-m outputs the microarchitecture, which is ARM64, and that uname-s outputs the system name, which is Darwin, the actual system name for macOS. The rest of the commands inside this block run Homebrew and a standard tool called PackageConfig to get the location of the libraries that Homebrew installed. It'd be great if HDF5 followed package config conventions, but it doesn't. So this is what the poetry command will look like in various scenarios. Hopefully this was enough to catch your interest and spark conversation for your Python team or any team struggling to quickly onboard developers to new code bases or code bases they've not touched in many months. I have no doubt that this system will improve over time, but on its second major iteration in a year and openly talking about it inside and outside of my company and contributing to several Python open source projects in that time, it's very clear to me that something like this is needed in some form for nearly all Python projects. We're working on other improvements as well, especially as my team adopts this setup for all of its repos. We've adopted it for about 25% of our repos and others will onboard in the coming weeks. The greatest challenge we've encountered so far in rolling this out is the one-time setup that's necessary to tell package managers like Homebrew, PyEnv, Poetry, and more where to look for executables. Some of it can be automated, but such often frustrates those who manage their dot files correctly, including myself. We've seen some troubleshooting complexity for folks with old setups. We don't want to mess up working setups, so as we move more and more towards a stricter environment setup as this time goes on. That is, we're more opinionated on where something gets installed so we can easily reference from our shiny setup while minimizing the work that the developer needs to do for one-time setup. That is, putting things into their shell configuration files. That's it for this presentation. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out and I'd be happy to share the most current iteration of this setup. Thank you very much.